Hey everyone, this is Mason Hutchison and welcome back to Herb Rally, your daily herbal podcast. We come out with new episodes about five days a week, so be sure to tune in often. Our goal for the show is to help you along your herbalist journey no matter what stage you're at. We have over 608 episodes, so feel free to peruse those episodes and you're bound to find something of interest. Today's episode is another Herbalist Hour interview, and this is with my good friend Yaakov Levine. Yaakov is a uh, nutritional health coach. And in a previous Herb Rally Updates video on our YouTube channel, we asked the Herb Rally audience to submit your nutrition questions for Yaakov to answer. And we received, I want to say about 120 to 130 questions. Um, Yaakov was only able to get to around a dozen of them or so. That said, we do have a round two scheduled. Uh, So before we leave for Wisconsin again... Uh, We're going to meet up with Yaakov, and he's going to do an Art of Frugal Nutrition module for us, Uh, so stay tuned for that. I'm super duper excited for that, but he's also going to do a round two uh, interview where he gets to uh, answer even more of your questions. So, uh, But yeah, today's interview is my first interview with Yaakov. We're going to start releasing these Herbalist Hour interviews probably about once a week. I have this week. I already have four interviews scheduled. Next week, I have I think three interviews scheduled, uh, and then next month, I'm already uh, yeah planning on interviews next month too. So, what started out with zero interviews with me uh, now is going to have a a lot of interviews. Uh, so. I would love to hear your feedback. If you want to email me, mason at herbrally.com, uh, you could give me feedback on what you think about the interviews, uh, whether positive or negative. Uh, I'm just really curious how y'all are digging it. Because, uh, yeah, previously the Herb Rally podcast was really just a bunch of random classes from herb conferences and uh, that kind of thing. So, But I'm really enjoying doing it. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting better at uh, interviewing people and And it's just kind of fun to sit down with my friends for an hour and then just kind of record the conversation uh, and see where that goes. So Uh, before we get into the show, I wanted to let you know that the International Herb Symposium is hosting a flash sale, uh, 15% off ticket prices. And that's now uh, through tomorrow. So you got to be listening to this present day to to take advantage of this 15% off discount. But I'll leave a link to uh, save 15% off on the International Herb Symposium in the show notes. So if you want to take advantage of that, uh, it's it's good through March 20th. That's Monday, March 20th, 2023. Uh, regardless of whether you say 15% or off or not, uh, definitely check out the International Herb Symposium. Uh, I will leave a link to that in the show notes as well, along with a link to their teacher profile because uh, the the presenters this year are just absolutely amazing. You're going to love the lineup. Uh, the event is June 9th to the 11th in Norton, Massachusetts. Uh, which is pretty close to Boston. So that's June 9th to the 11th, Norton, Massachusetts. Check out the International Herb Symposium. Also, before we get into the show, I wanted to let you know that Erica Gallantin's webinar called The Business of Clinical Herbal Practice is coming up. It's tomorrow, and it's available to all of our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members. If you'd like to check out the webinar, just uh, click the link in the show notes. Like I said, it's available for Herb Rally Schoolhouse members, and if you'd like to give your first 30 days a try of the schoolhouse, just use coupon code WEBINAR30 at herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. Um, And yeah, if this sounds of interest, even if you're not able to make the live event, we are actually going to be publishing the two-hour webinar uh, for all of our schoolhouse members to watch the replay. So uh, the business of clinical herbal practice with Erica Gallantin, Uh, webinar is going to be tomorrow, March 20th from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and a recording will be made available to all Herb Rally Schoolhouse members. Uh, Use coupon code WEBINAR30 at checkout to get your first 30 days for free. And a huge, 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 huge thank you uh, to all of our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members. Uh, Your support means everything to me and Amanda, so we really, really appreciate it. And thanks to you, dear listener. Oh, I did want to mention, and I'll probably bring this up a few times, uh, in your podcast feed, you're going to see like a little plant and a little uh, clock before the episode. That's going to be your way of differentiating uh, these Herbalist Hour episodes because this is a daily podcast. We put out a lot of episodes, uh, but I want you to be able to quickly and easily see which, which episodes are the Herbalist Hour. So... Uh, If you see the emojis plant and clock, that means herbalist hour, Um, and that's going to do it for me today. Enjoy today's episode with Yaakov Levine answering your nutrition questions. Oops, I wanted to say one more thing. 
These interviews are also available on our YouTube channel. And typically speaking, they're available about a week or more uh, before they're available on the podcast feed. So if you want to check out these uh, interviews sooner than later, and if you want to see our faces and whatnot and our uh, body language and all that jazz, uh, you could check out uh, Herb Rally on YouTube. You could just go to youtube.com slash C slash Herb Rally or just search for Herb Rally. Um, we're up to over 3,000 subscribers and we release anywhere from one to five herbalism of her week, uh, including these herbalist hour podcast episodes uh, sooner than they hit the podcast feed. So uh, please go and subscribe to our Herb Rally channel on YouTube. Uh, and now that's really, really, really going to do it for me today. I will talk to you later. Bye. A little bit of housekeeping before we get into the show. The content in this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. It is not intended to cure, diagnose, treat, or prevent any disease. This information has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. We are not doctors, nor do we play one on the internet. Please seek advice from a qualified healthcare professional. Okay, MC Calico, take it away. Yeah. Smoking herbal blends. We need some mullin and some kush, my brethren. While listening to Herb Rally podcast again. Herbalism at its finest with Mason Hutchinson. Yeah. Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to yet another episode of the Herbalist Hour. Today we have on my friend Yaakov Levine, and I don't know if Yaakov necessarily identifies as an herbalist, but he's certainly a nutrition expert. Uh, I'm excited to dive more into his story. Um, I haven't really had a chance to kind of hear about your background and how you got mm -hmm. into her herbalism and thus nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wanted to say was uh, we actually asked the, uh, the Herb Rally audience to submit nutrition questions. Uh, in our last updates video, and we got about 130. Uh, I highly doubt we'll, we'll be able to get through all of those today, but uh, Yaakov's gonna do his best. Um, so Yaakov, welcome to the show. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good, good, to, good to be with you here, and uh, it's, I'm very excited to have this conversation and answer questions as best I can. That's right, so yeah. Um, so first, I really wanna know, how did you get into herbalism and mm -hmm. thus kind of your transition into becoming a nutritional health coach? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, currently I work with, with natural grocers and uh, as a nutritional health coach, we have one in each of our stores and, and it's a wonderful role for me to be able to, to use all the skills that I have and knowledge I have to share with our community and uh, have opportunities like this as, as well. I, my, my hobby from a young age was, was learning how to be healthy. I grew up, my dad had heart disease and was disabled from when I was about five. And uh, for, you know, for, for most of my life, I've been trying to do it differently and try to be healthy so that I wouldn't, wouldn't have heart disease like my dad had. And uh, um, had various, um, it, it was a hobby. It was a hobby and you know, I, at various places that I worked, I was kind of like the health nut. <laughs> and, uh, and I uh, had uh, tried different kinds of diets, uh, macrobiotic, uh, vegetarian. Uh, um, now I eat a more omnivorous diet. And uh, that path uh, finally in the, in, in the um, late 80s took me into doing this work professionally. I was, I was in the corporate world and living in, in Oklahoma and Tulsa and um, got downsized out of my corporate job. I was a project manager for a manufacturing company. Did some aptitude tests at the university about what to do, what to do next. They said, oh, you should be doing some kind of work helping people. I you know, didn't know what that would be, maybe going back to school. And, after I left that appointment with that uh, information from that uh, counselor at the university, I stopped at my local health food store where I used to hang out a lot and read their books and pick their brains and got a job offer <laughs> to work in the uh, supplement department at, at the health food store in, in Tulsa. And, uh, and you know, within a period of time, I was working in management and have been doing off and on that kind of work ever since. I've worked in other, other retail settings and also worked in... Uh, private practice and, uh, and, um, and now, now back in retail. And I got to getting more, more of an herbal background when as part of my role as a retailer in California, in the Bay Area, I got to do a, a, a weekend uh, retailer visit at, at Herb Farm. Mm -hmm. and, and then that uh, grew a few months later. I did the, uh, what they called at that time back in the 90s, uh, apprentice program. 
and uh, got connected with the Brighton Bush Herbal Conference and started you know, finding more herbal teachers to, uh, to learn more and to be able to, uh, to dive deeper. And, um, you know, and then, you know, through my connections with, with, with uh, people I, I, I connected with in the herbal community, I got to more nu nutrition studies and, and got my credentials as a, uh, a nutritional therapy practitioner and uh, used that, those, to, to, those credentials to do, to, to do my role here at Natural Grocers. What's the school called that you went to for the Nutritional Therapy? It was therapy? the Nutritional Therapy Association. Oh, okay, that's right. Out of Olympia, Washington, and they have a year-long program, and uh, there is, they have two different programs. I did the functional, functional. so I have an FNT, an FNTP as my credentials, Functional Nutritional Therapy Practitioner, and uh, looking at the whole body and not looking at symptoms or things, like, and, and just it really tied in well with my... Uh, with my herbal studies, I had studied, I did the apprenticeship. I also studied with uh, Torna Lodog, mm. a program that she had that was online at the time. It was, it was before online, it was, you know, was sure. before, before, before internet. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then I was having a conversation with one of my uh, herbalist friends, a mutual friend, uh, Tracy Bozian, and I said, you know, Tracy, Hi, Tracy. Tracy, what can I, uh, what can I do to, to tie everything together? You know, everything I've learned and, herb, herb, you know, herbal medicine and nutrition. And she had just finished this program, the nutrition program at Nutritional Therapy Association, and I signed up and uh, finished that in 2007 and been, you know, working professionally since. Very cool. It, nutrition and the study of nutrition, for me, I found very addictive as well. And then, yeah, it kind of led into the whole herbalism realm and mm -hmm. I always kind of look at the herbalists that I know the clinical herbalists they almost do play kind of this nutritionist role in a mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. um, Tracy actually recommended the same school for me I remember expressing interest to her at the Portland Tea Festival mm -hmm. she's like you got to check out this program so I assume it's still around yeah all right I'm gonna link to that in the yeah. show notes for yeah. sure um, well, thanks for sharing your story. Is there yeah. anything else you wanted to kind of dive in regarding that? Well, or? We could probably go for a couple hours. Yeah, but, exactly. you know, let's Maybe we can get some, get some questions. Let's do <laughs> it. All right, we're going to jump right in. So again, thanks to the Herb Rally audience for submitting these. These are some awesome, yeah. awesome questions. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start with the theme of chocolate. There's actually two separate questions, mm -hmm. as you know. And uh, we'll just start with the first one. This one was left by D. Elena. And they ask, my nutrition question is about chocolate. I love chocolate, especially dark chocolate. What's up with the recent reports of many of my favorite brands containing cadmium and lead? The horror. I still love chocolate, so how can I continue to indulge safely? Well, you can still enjoy your chocolate, and I'll, let me tell you why. Um, Consumer Reports, uh, unfortunately, um, when they wrote their reports and they listed all these levels of cadmium and lead for all these different chocolate companies, they weren't using the, the, the appropriate uh, Prop 65 standard. Prop 65 mm -hmm. is a standard, is a um, labeling standard, um, an ingredient standard from the state of California for uh, anything that could be potentially toxic. And typically it comes up a lot with lead because anything that grows in the ground is gonna have lead in it. And, and if, if they were to use the appropriate standards for chocolate that were uh, adopted in 2018, they wouldn't have had an article to write because it wouldn't have been an issue. Okay. So it's just as simple as that's concerned. And and uh, um, I've for fortunately I've had a, a few of the uh, uh, chocolate companies that have you know co corrected that and mailed to share uh, to share that we could still be enjoying. It's I mean it's, it's still great to have less of those heavy metals. Mm -hmm. And I know the chocolate um, the um, the lead is in the, in, the, in the cocoa beans, and the cadmium is more in the ground that the, the dust that, you know, while the beans are drying and fermenting, they, they get a little bit more of that cadmium. But it's, again, it's still, it's, it still uh, is within the, the safe realm of the standards of the 2018 standards from Prop 65. I remember working at Mountain Reserves, any product that went to California mm -hmm. would be slapped with a Prop yeah. 65 sticker no matter what it was. So. You know, and, and most, you know, and the, and the EU has their own standard as well. It's a little bit different. And um, most of the companies are going to do, not going to do separate products just for California to be within a certain standard. And that was made easier, certainly easier to do when they, uh, when they um, brought that, those standards into reality in 2018 with the, with the standards that, that were adopted back then. Right on. Cool. Uh, so SH asks about chocolate as well. They say, I would love to hear from the nutritionist about his opinion on erythritol. 
I've used it in small, quanti small quantities for years, mostly in Lily's chocolate, and now it's in the news as potentially dangerous things. Yeah, there was a recent uh, study that was published from the Journal of Nature um, that talked about erythritol being uh, related to, um, to uh, cardiovascular uh, um, issues. And um, when you take, a, take a, a deeper dive into you know, the study and, and what, they, what, they, what they were reporting, was this when they did that study? It was before erythritol was had gotten its um, uh, grass status to be able to use in foods. The GRS, GRAS, generally recognized as safe, oh. which is a standard that needs that a, a ingredient has to pass to be able to be put into food ingredients. So they're not they weren't they weren't measuring um, erythritol that folks were ingesting. They were they were measuring in these studies um, endogenous um, erythritol. We produce it. In our in our bodies, when as a as a as a reaction to having uh, um, more um, sugar in our system mm. circulating in our system, so the folks that are having um, high amounts of uh, erythritol endogenous again endogenous means it's made in our body exogenous would be uh, what we would get from the out from from our external sources, mm. and so the um, erythritol um, is. Um, that could be poten potentially a problem is what, what's produced as a result of having too much sugar in our diets, basically, and, and also higher levels of uh, insulin, you know, and insulin resistance. When, when we have insulin resistance, we have uh, carbohydrates in our diet that turn to sugars, but then this, the insulin isn't able to get the, in, the sugar into our cells, so we end up having it circulating in our systems, and that, that's when we, would, as a reaction, we produce more erythritol. Okay. And, um, so it's again, it's 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 probably uh, it, it, there needs to be more studies, and I guess at some point maybe the, there there'll be a study to study actual um, you know when it's used as as a as an addition to uh, to our sweet treats that we enjoy. I know with a lot of folks doing uh, uh, ketogenic diets or low carb diets, it's 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 more and more in in foods, and um, you know so I I'm. I'm I guess for myself, um, I've been using stevia for many years, and, be, and and stevia at one point also was didn't have grass status, and it was only it was being sold as a as, you know you can get liquid stevia that was sold as a body care product, and uh, we were able to use that. I we I, I used to grow my own when I would live somewhere with longer growing season in Southern Oregon, and then dry the leaves and just use that as a sweetener. And, mm. um, it's a little little more less processed than the. And the uh, extracts and the, and the processing of the erythritol or the, or the processing of the stevia extracts as well. Uh, stevia extract is basically just the plant, and then it's tinctured. Is that well, but yeah, they 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 just they just um, they um, isolate the rubenicides, mm -hmm. just just one part of it. And as a herbalist, I like the whole the idea of the whole sure. plant. Yeah. You know, there's constituents in the whole plant that we can benefit from, and and uh, um, so you know, I I like. To, that's my pref preferred way to, to use uh, a stevia sweetener, but I think if you, you're using it uh, uh, in a uh, not overusing it, um, honey and, and maple syrup are wonderful choices as well. That's that's what we use a lot in our household. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, right on. Cool. Uh, Eclipsic Herbs says, "I'd love to know their thoughts on how nutrition advice can vary based on culture." Oh yeah, I really like this one. Uh, for instance, here in the states, carbs like rice are frowned upon, even though Many cultures around the world see it as a staple food. Thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, that's um, and that's that's one of the um, when I, you know when I, when I look at myself as a, somebody working with, with folks functionally, mm -hmm. you know, part of it is like, well, where is where, what part of the world is this person from, or their ancestors from, and and um, and we're we're, we're 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 kind of wired to eat what we're what we're used to. Um, and one of the examples that I that I think of, I'm, do, I'm doing a presentation uh, this week on uh, health benefits of salt. The title of the war on salt. We've been hmm. we can probably do a whole conversation just about salt. And and uh, there's you know the Korean paradox where the uh, in the in the Korean diet they'll have uh, um, six seven thousand milligrams of salt a day as a regular part of their diet. And um, not having any, they have the, lo the lowest rates of uh, high blood pressure, you know, of, of uh, other of the other populations that have been studied, and uh, you know, salt has been demonized as uh, 
as um, being problematic for raising blood pressure. So we've been told since the 70s not to use salt. Again, it's you know not really good information. The reason that we have have high uh, blood pressure uh, would be more from the extra insulin that we have when we have high sugar, a high sugar diet, and the sugar insulin makes us uh, retain uh, sodium and raise our blood pressure. So, again, it's you know it's uh, um, looking at a little bit closer to what's really going on is uh, always a, a good thing. Um, so I, I try to when I'm working with folks uh, as you know, doing a coaching session or when I'm teaching, I try to, to, to be where the folks are and you know where they are culturally. And uh, so if, if somebody is having issues with um, blood sugar imbalance, um, maybe they need to, um, to look at where in their diet they can moderate the carbohydrates. Maybe, maybe it might not be the rice part if that's part of their culture and their, their, you know, their, their, com their comfort to have. Um, it might be looking at other ways to reduce uh, car carbohydrates so that they can uh, uh, meet their health goals. Just on the salt front, doesn't it kind of depend on what kind of salt you're consuming too? Say like yeah. the pure refined stuff versus say yeah. the Himalayan pink salt. Yeah, definitely. And that's part of the problem is, is uh, you know, uh, we, 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 we can have all sorts of health challenges when we eat a lot of processed food that's loaded in, in sodium. And, um, but we really need it. It's critical. You know, when, when I work with folks that are with, with athletes, one of the first things I talk to them about is, is uh, you know, don't, don't be drinking so much water unless you're having a lot of salt with it. You know, and uh, um, and it, you and you can make your own. I, if I can give you a quick recipe for sure. a for a quick electrolyte yeah. uh, drink that you don't have to you know purchase. Uh, so I I will get um, real salt, which is one of my favorites. It's from Utah, and I I think it might have the most complex mixture of trace minerals or electrolytes in it. And I take a quart mason jar, mason, yeah, mason, <laughs> and, the appropriate name, and yeah, yeah. and. Um, and I put a cup of uh, real salt in it, fill it up with water, let it sit overnight. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's called Soleil, maybe you've heard of that. It's an old fashioned way of doing uh, electrolytes. So w when you get up the next morning, you'll notice there's a little layer of, of salt at the bottom of the jar, and then you know that that water is fully saturated, it's holding all the sodium chloride and all the other trace minerals in there. And, and you know, we, after we've been um, sleeping all night and being you know, dehydrating, not being not hydrating while we're sleeping, yeah, start your day off with a tall glass of water, warm water. Add a tablespoon or, or, or two of the Soleil to that water and drink that to start your day to rehydrate. Start your day off that way. And, and I, I use that, I'll suggest that a lot with, with athletes or anybody that's the summer when we're sweating more sure. and losing more. But if we're just getting water uh, in t intake um, and not getting the trace minerals that come in that salt, um, then we're, we can be dehydrated because basically we're we're pouring water in and pouring it out and not using it. And you know, I, I jokingly say with the folks when you you know when you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror, you're seeing that you know make sure everything's working right. <laughs> you're seeing a a, a a billion cells that are working together. Yeah. Each of those cells need nutrients and need water. So you want to get that water to the cells and and that those electrolytes or trace minerals is is the delivery system. Such a good reminder. Uh, I've been trying to be better about waking up in the morning just chugging a pint of like spring water right when mm -hmm. we get up as opposed to immediately consuming some sort of stimulant and I, I love the tip about making it you call it the soleil soleil yeah. yeah that's great i definitely i've been i've been doing that for years as well where you, you can add a little, little bit of lemon juice as well yeah. and um you know to help with the acid alkaline balance sure. that would be a good thing as well and some or apple cider vinegar you can there do you that go. as well yeah and it's a, just a great way to to start your day off and maybe later on have some of the stimulants you know Sure. If, if you need yeah, that, yeah. You, you know, my, my goal, my goal in life is not to need that. So yeah, amen. Up, yeah. I, you know, I, I think I pretty much for most of my, I mean, there were, you know, years ago, uh, my first career was as a, a dairy farmer, and I worked a lot of hours and uh, didn't get a lot of sleep. Often was had to get up in the middle of the night to to help support a birth of a calf or something, and and uh, so I, I I needed that coffee to get started. Sure. But uh, for most of my life, I've uh, prided myself on just being ready to go. Yeah you know, from, you know, not having to need a coffee to wake up. It's definitely become uh, a crutch, you mm -hmm. know. And yeah. Yeah. And I, and I love, love a good, good or great in coffee. I love yeah. the taste. But I'll have that later in the day, you right. know, just for enjoyment, not, yeah. not to wake me up. Totally. Yeah. Sweet. Well, we got onto water. That's great. Yeah. I didn't expect that. All right. Uh, so Jesse Jens asks, uh, this is fun. Thanks for the community that you've grown and continually and continually expanding with your tending. 
Thanks, Jesse. Uh, I'd like to hear about cooked foods versus raw food and what an optimal balance might be per season, body type, or other factors. Thanks. Yeah, again, we can talk a whole hour about that. <laughs> but, you know, the, the short piece on that is that we're, we're all different, and we all, um, and, and, e and e even, even each of us at different times have uh, maybe something going on, you know, different ways our digestion's working. And, and, you know, sometimes folks will be eating, um, not having the digestive fire they need, and not be able to digest raw raw vegetables or raw foods and, and would better be able to get the nutrients um, when they're cooked. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of folks, you know, they come to me and say, I, I don't know, I just eat really well and I'm just not feeling good and my, my, you know, my digestion's off and everything. I said, well, try you know, just eating cooked vegetables for a while, no raw vegetables. And, um, and you know, they say, oh no, I, mean, I can't have a salad. And, you know, and they come back and see me and you know, you know, I'm feeling better, you know. So it depends on you know time. You know, the you know the Ayurvedic uh, teachers teach us, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about it in, in maybe in Western medicine, we are what we eat. We talk about that a lot. Mm -hmm. And the Ayurvedic doctors uh, teach us we are what we digest. And you know, so we need to look at for each individual, uh, one of us, how, what's going to work for us to be able to to digest our food and. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's more chance it might be cooked rather than raw. Yeah, it really comes down to listening to your body. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. I think that's an underrated piece of I don't know how many advice. times I say that a, a day, yeah. listening to your body to folks and, you know, well, is it going to be good for me? Well, what is it? What, what happens when you have that? Well, I don't feel good. Well, maybe it's not a good choice. <laughs> or I feel good. Or at least for now, it's not or, a good yeah, choice. Or, or, right, wrong. exactly, yeah. exactly. Because we're constantly, change, as we age, yeah. um, uh, you know, you know, I don't know if anybody, anybody what, listening to this, are, are you having, you have any stress ever? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're having uh, um, stress, then some, your, your digestion might not be working as, as, as well as it would if, if you were uh, in uh, rest and digest mode. You know, if you're, if you're in what we call fight or flight mode or, or sympathetic mode, it's, it's harder for us to digest our food and get the nutrients. We can be eating really good food and still be malnourished. Yeah. You know? You're not what you eat, you're what you digest. What we digest, and we that. are what we don't digest as well. Sure. <laughs> which is another part of that, part right. of that picture. Yep. Uh, Nicole Shepard says, I know magnesium is a huge deficiency across the population, and I'm wondering what are some of the most common nutritional deficiencies and what are some herbs that can help? Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Yeah, magnesium is one of the biggies. Because mm -hmm. we, you know, there's like 300 different enzyme operations in our body that require magnesium, and I'd say probably maybe 80% of our population doesn't have enough magnesium, and it's hard to get. You know, I'm you know a lifelong foodie, um, you know, health coach, herbalist. I'd love it if I could say, okay, you can eat this food and you'll get all the nutrients you need. And I don't think we can anymore. Really, it's very sad. And you know, as we get more and more into more regenerative agriculture and building the soil, and we'll have more nutrients. You know, uh, one of the Thing, another term that I like to use uh, is uh, we are what we eat eats mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, you know it's uh, so for example if we're uh, um, if, if we are um, eating or organic and regeneratively grown uh, produce then the soil is going to have nutrients in it the uh, you know organic farmers will add minerals to the soil between crops they'll do a green manure you know, the, uh, they'll do maybe less tilling, hopefully, and there'll be more nutrients if the nutrients are in the soil than it will be in the food. Um, and um, I think I got lost on that. On the... Was it because of the birds? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, well, I also, I could chime I, in, I too. I want to finish that question. Yeah, yeah. That. Do you want me to reread it? Yeah, I want yeah. you to let's, re let's redo it. Yeah. Uh, Sorry about that. No, it's all good. Uh, I... <laughs> Amanda will work it all out. Yeah. Uh, I know magnesium is a huge deficiency across the population, and I'm wondering what are some of the best, some of the most common nutritional deficiencies, and what are some herbs that can help? Well, again, um, magnesium is a biggie because um, we really we need that for over 300 enzyme operations in our body. We can't use our vitamin D if we don't have enough magnesium, and uh, uh, about 80% of our population doesn't have enough magnesium, and. Um, Again, with our organic and regenerative agriculture, we get more nutrients in our foods, but still probably probably not enough. And when I think about herbs to to support, you know, to get uh, nutrients, I think more about 
uh, looking at herbs for um, supporting digestion. Mm. So if you know if we uh, if we're supporting our digestion, then we'll get more nutrients that are in in our food, so, including uh, minerals too. Hmm? Including minerals. Including minerals. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, and that's well, this, don't, let me forget about talking about infusions, sure. but yeah. uh, but as far as just eating, you know, from our from our herbs and and our and our vegetables, um, if we have enough uh, di digestive fire, and you know, so traditionally, I don't know if you ever had a, a salad before meal with like salad greens. Sure. Yeah. You know and. And if we don't smother our salad greens in, with uh, with a lot of sweet tasting salad dressings, they have a little bit of a bitter taste. Sure. And those, you know, so we traditionally start our meals with uh, with the bitters, which send a set message to our brain, and send a message to our digestive system to, uh, you know, create the digestive juices we need to get the nutrients out of our out of our food. So when I think about minerals, I think, well, okay, let's you know support digestion. So herbal bitters is always is a favorite of mine and regular regularly in, in my repertoire for myself and uh, you know trying to, to remind folks to, to just to uh, um, not multitask while you're eating as well that's a, a big issue in our society I don't know how many times when I'm driving on i5 coming into town and I see somebody they're on their phone they're texting they're eating a sandwich <laughs> putting makeup on all at the same time and driving yeah it's kind of scary anyway yeah and uh, so they're probably not going to digest that meal and eventually they're going to come see me because they're going to have digestive issues and malnutrition yeah so uh, supporting digestion is, is really important. Uh, you know, our, our uh, green leafy vegetables are going to be rich in, in magnesium and calcium, and and uh, so having organic and regeneratively growing grown is, is is best, or out of your backyard, of course, if you grow that way. Sure. And um, supporting digestion, I, I think that's a little bit of a theme we're we're having today. Supporting digestion is really important. Uh, I was so proud of my daughter. She asked for arugula the other day, mm -hmm. which I, w I don't know if I necessarily consider it bitter, but it definitely has some pungency. And yeah. maybe, maybe to some people it would be bitter. Yeah. But yeah, just there's probably all sorts of other phytonutrients going on in there. Yeah, it's one of the most nutrient dense greens we have. So yeah. that's wonderful. I love it. Uh, don't for And you didn't want me to let you forget about the infusions, which I actually yeah. had a question about as well. Yeah. Um, basically, it, say I'm consuming lots of oat straw and nettle infusions. Am I getting, do you think, we're getting enough magnesium from that. But uh -huh. what I've been doing lately is I've been adding magnesium powder to my mm -hmm. uh, oat straw infusion. I'm just curious if that, is that overkill or? No, it's uh, not. Yeah. We're mainly gonna be getting calcium okay. from those. And uh, you know, we've learned from our, our wonderful teacher, Susan Weed, um, about, in, about infusions. Yeah. And uh, learned it. You, know, we, uh, you know, if we were to, you know, and, and, when, and what, what we learned is to do an infusion, an overnight infusion, to fully get the minerals out of the out of the herbs, and um, you know if you were to do a uh, uh, just a you know a few minute um, uh, infusion of of um, oat straw or, or nettles, you'd get maybe maybe 50 60 milligrams of, of calcium. An overnight infusion, you'd get a 500 milligrams out of that same cup. Wow! And you know those are wonderful ways to get those nutrients that way, and uh, and you know having the having adding the magnesium to that is a wonderful. Uh, combination to get to maximize the, the benefit of that very cool and um, yeah it's just a wonderful what we what we can get you know some herbs we we get more benefit when we do an infusion than we might do a, a alcohol extract or a glycerite mm -hmm. so that's a a, um, a good thing to know yeah yeah I actually kind of like the flavor of the magnesium I use I think it's called natural calm some yeah powder stuff yeah. yeah so all right on to the next question uh, Verity Herbs and Wellness asks, I would love to hear from a nutritionist about the different types of magnesium and their indications. Thanks so much. Yeah, great. That's yeah. A, a good, good, good segue. Yeah. Um, um, magnesium, um, there's different, different forms of it. There is magnesium taurinate. That's mag, mag, minerals need to be, when they're in supplements, need to be combined with uh, some kind of acid or amino acid so that our body can 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 recognize it and use it. Otherwise, it would be trying to like eat rocks, okay. and that really our body wouldn't recognize that. Sure. So, um, when there's different combinations uh, for different goals. They 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 have, there's a lot of crossover. But for example, if you combine uh, magnesium with amino acid taurine, you get magnesium taurinate, which is great for supporting cardiovascular health. Um, oh. If you're um, combining magne magnesium with uh, threonic acid, you get magnesium l 3 and 8 which is a form of magnesium that will cross the blood-brain barrier and get more magnesium to your brain. Mm. And um, 
And one of my one of my favorite forms, besides the Com magnesium that you mentioned that you add to your herbal infusion, is uh, magnesium glycinate. It's magnesium combined with uh, amino acid glycine, so that you absorb it a little bit slower, and have the opportunity to have it on board more hours of the day, um, and uh, and without causing digestive upset. Mm -hmm. And some folks will will be sensitive to magnesium. Uh, uh, especially the less expensive forms, say for example, magnesium oxide, will not absorb well, and it'll just hang out in the in the colon and just collect water, and then you end up, you know, folks will use that often as a uh, as a uh, purg purg purgative. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, again, mag mag and with um, with 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 uh, minerals and other nutrients, we we need them 24/7. We don't just need them, you know, for the couple hours after we take a supplement. Or eat a meal, so when we have something like the magnesium glycinate on board, we'll have it on board 24/7. You take some in the morning, you take some at night with, with breakfast and with dinner, and your body doesn't have to do triage. You know, if your body does triage, some of the operations that that need magnesium will happen, but some of them won't. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we when we you know when we talk about health, we you know our, my my goal in life is to increase what I call health span. You know, we have lifespan. You know how long we live. Yeah. Our health span is how long we feel good. <laughs> and that gap is getting wider and wider. Mm -hmm. And when we're looking at having nutrients we need, you know, all the times of, you know, day, day and night, that's one of the, you know, key, crucial ways that we can support our health span so that we'll, we'll feel good. You know, I want to have like a really wonderful day and maybe teach a class or hang out with some friends. And, you know, if I don't wake up the next day, you know, I don't, not, not, I'm not in a hurry for that. Sure. But that I've, I've you know, lived, lived my life to my fullest up to the last minute. That, that's my goal. We all have people in our lives that we've seen suffer, and maybe the last few years weren't so cool. And so that's part of why, even I, I tried, you know, retiring from this work a few years ago. I, I can't because I, I'll still need to uh, to teach and, and share what I know with folks. I love it. Yeah, magnesium does seem like a pretty affordable way to significantly improve health overall. Mm. Yeah, I have somebody. I have somebody come in to see me yesterday, and they. They, um, I, you know, they they were looking for some. The, they have issues with sleep. I said, okay, you have issues with sleep, and uh, um, do you have any other? Do you um, have any muscle cramps? Yeah, muscle cramps. Um, are you? Um, did you have a, a bone density test? Yeah, I did miserable on that. I have osteoporosis. And so, and then the last question I'll ask is, I asked was, do you crave chocolates? Oh man, I got the chocolate all the time. Those are those are all indications of being low in magnesium. Okay. <laughs> and um, it's kind of like you know all, all the dots were connected, and it, and it's just a simple way to support a lot of aspects of our health. Like I said, 300 different enzyme operations that happen in our body rely on magnesium. If we don't have it, you know. Amanda's always craving chocolate. Maybe she just needs more magnesium. A good chance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you can still eat chocolate and enjoy <laughs> it, you know. But you know, it's different to be you know just craving it. It's a little different. Sure. Great answer. Yeah. Oh, and I really like the point about, uh, I want to say you said something like magnesium is paired with like some sort of acid. Is that yeah. right? I never heard that before and it makes sense because yeah, the natural calm has this very like fizzy, uh, sour yeah. taste to it. Yeah, and, and in the case of the, 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 the calm, they, um, it's, it's activated by the heat in, that you put it, when you put it in, in your infusion. Mm. You know, the, okay. the heat will activate that and make it more absorbable and, and how folks will use that kind of powder is you can titrate that to bowel tolerance. You know, once if um, once you're having issues with that and to start with, yeah. um, you just gradually increase your dosage. And they, they say that in the bottle. Yeah, they do um, up to two teaspoons. I yeah. Think. yeah. And if once you start to get a little bit of you know loose bowels and yeah. you cut back and you know that your your body is getting all it needs. And you can you can also um, use vitamin C the same way. You can titrate that to. Uh, to tolerance um, as well. So. Now I did bring you an oat straw infusion, but yeah. I did not put magnesium in there. Okay. So. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna check it out. Yeah. yeah. And it's the, yeah, have, the Susan Weed that. method, one ounce per yeah. uh, uh, quart. And I have I have my magnesium glycinate on board, so I'll do this one. There you cheers. go. All right. Cheers. Good mm -hmm. Cheers. Mm, it's good. Thank Welcome you. to the infusion hour. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving right along. Katie Lent says, hi, thank you for highlighting nutrition. 
Uh, I'd love to learn more about electrolytes. What's the best way to replace them and how can you know which ones you need most? Kind of sounds like I the, think we covered that yeah, the, earlier the with, water. Um, with the with the Soleil or, and yeah. using plenty of, just uh, get, get and get a good amount of um, of uh, um, real salt, uh, Himalayan salt, Celtic salt. Uh, get some Maldon uh, fishing, finishing salt and just use that liberally. Great, great suggestion. Uh, Allison Rohde says, wow, there's so many good questions here. I can't wait for this interview. <laughs> uh, my question is, what nutritional support would you suggest for someone who has had their digestion affected by a stroke and is experiencing disordered digestion and nausea. Okay, um, one of my one of my uh, favorite herbs for digestion is ginger, and uh, it's just a wonderful, e inexpensive and easy way to support digestion. Uh, and um, Paul Schulich, uh, a founder of the New Chapter Supplement Company, mm. wrote a whole book on ginger, and I don't think there's an aspect of our health that's not supported by that herb. And so it's a wonderful choice for, for um, pretty much anything that ails us. Um, also, you know, again, herbal bitters to support with, uh, with impacts like um, uh, st strokes and other, other challenges that, that impacts our nervous system. So you want to be able to support your digestion with um, whatever you can to, to using herbal bitters and um, also um, you know, again, trying really hard to not be multitasking when you're having a meal. You know, years ago I had opportunities to do a, a 10 day meditation retreat. And everything about that retreat, was, when you're walking, it was walking meditation. When you're sitting, you were sitting and, you know, working on your breath and, and, and uh, just, just connecting with uh, being, being mindful in, 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 in the moment. And when you're eating, you were not sitting across from anybody, you were not making eye contact, you weren't talking, you weren't on your phone, you weren't doing. All you were doing was eating, and it was a wonderful lesson for me to learn about how when, when you truly get into that uh, rest and digest mode or parasympathetic mode, how, how, how wonderful our digestion can, can work. So for somebody that's been impacted by something like a stroke, that would be really a ideal to do eating meditation, basically. And, you know, we do so many things. You know, we try to have a, you know, no phones at the table in our house, and we don't succeed most of the time, but we, we, <laughs> talk, about, <laughs> we, talk, we talk about it. We talk about doing that. Sure. And, um, you know, or, and we definitely, you know, I'm grateful that I didn't grow up watching TV while we eat. My parents didn't think that was a good thing. And uh, we do so many things while we're eating, and, and that we're, not, we're not designed for that. We're really designed to just be focusing on our meals and not be doing all that multitasking. I mean, we, we're in the multitasking era, I think. Such a good reminder. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I read a book, very influential early on in my hippie days as I became a hippie, and it's called Be Here Now. Yeah. Uh, and I remember there was some chapter based specifically around when you're eating, just focus just on eat. your eating. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. It's, it's probably a very underrated aspect as far as like improving your digestion and yeah. everything. You know, if any, everybody watching this today, if that's, if that's all you learn from this, that yeah. would be huge. Yeah. I really, love that. Really important. Kathy Wynn asks, uh, are herbal glycerites nutritional as much as infusions? I've been making them and started adding hibiscus and rose extracts to my teas and even ginger ale, and I love it, but don't want to waste it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, you know, again, um, we learned from one of my favorite guides is Herbal Medicine from the Heart of the Earth from by Cheryl Tilner. And, uh, um, and one of the parts that she has for each of the herbs in, in, her, in, her, in, her, in her books is you know what are the best ways to, to do a formulation? It depends on the herb. If it's you know, you know you do different kinds of herbal extracts if depending on you know how resinous the herb is or mm. or uh, what you know. Some herbs are, you can get a lot of the nutrients just from an infusion. So uh, I don't. There's no really wrong way mm -hmm. to do it. But um, if you're getting the results that work for you, that's then you're getting getting good results. I don't. You know I I think that's part of it is uh, and part of it part of the the, the beauty of uh, herbal medicine of the plants uh, is to, to just experience them and see how, how they feel for you, how they feel, how that feels that tea or that glyceride or, you know, some folks have want to avoid alcohol, so glyceride is a good alternative uh, for some, some, herb, some herbs that way, not necessarily uh, any of the high, high resin herbs would, not, would probably not work. Yeah, it goes back to listening to your body yeah. and how you feel. Great, great point. Uh, Kathleen Drew asks, I hear so much these days about needing to take daily vitamins to ensure that we can get all of our required nutrients. Mm -hmm. And even if a 
even if we eat a balanced and varied diet, it might be difficult to get what is needed. I'd like to know what your thoughts are. Yeah, and, you know, and it, and it, it, it is, again, um, to my sadness, we don't have the same nutrients we had um, in, in the past. Uh, um, there's a wonderful book by Joe Robinson, Eating on the Wild Side, mm. and she's one of, the, one of the country's experts on pastured beef, and uh, many years ago she thought, you know, there's a missing piece if we're having this, this really good quality protein um, what about the other nutrients that we get from the plants that work with the, uh, that make that a complete uh, balanced diet? And she started doing some research. She's up, on, up in Washington State, I think Bastion Island. She has a demonstration garden where she was growing some of the more original versions of the, of the fruits and vegetables that we eat now mm -hmm. and um, just so much more higher in, in, in nutrients than what we have available now. Everything is grown to be bigger and grow faster and... and uh, even even with organics, unfortunately, so we uh, we we sadly um, um, we, we we need the that multivitamin to fill in the gaps, you know, little gaps. It's a, you can call that an insurance, mm -hmm. and it's just a way to uh, you know to fill in. And when folks come to me and they say, "I want to get a multivitamin," which one should I get? I say, "Well, how's your diet?" And you know, if if they if they're eating a really healthy diet and it's organic, uh, maybe biodynamic, maybe regeneratively grown. Maybe a one a day would just give them that a little extra that they might need. If they're having what I call a Happy Meal diet or, <laughs> or, a, or a drive through diet, then I would say maybe you need a, you know, a two or three a day multivitamin sure. to make up what you're missing. Uh, it all, again, it all depends on each person, and, and there's no one size fits all. Uh, just kind of an aside, but do you have any thoughts on um, fish oil supplements, omega threes, and stuff like that? That's the, that's the same thing. I, I, you know, if I could convince everybody to eat sardines regularly. Yeah. Yeah then um, we would get, and also, it's not only, you know, so, so I'll, for example, I'll be in the vitamin aisles in the store here, and somebody will be standing in the, in front of the turmeric mm -hmm. section, and because they, you know, they're, 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 obviously they're seeing they have some kind of inflammation and pain, and, and, and you know, turmeric is a sexy nutrient <laughs> for that, and it can be very helpful, so they'll, they'll, I'll ask them the question I have to ask, I have to, well, what are you eating that's causing the, contributing to your inflammatory response that you're having. It's a, well, I don't know, I want to talk about that, <laughs> you know, but, um, but often it's an eye-opener for folks because um, when we were hunter-gatherers, and I don't think we've changed so much genetically from, from then, we had a balance, a uh, one-to-one balance of omega-6 to omega-3, mm -hmm. and we didn't have all the itises we have now. Maybe we were, you know, a young age, we got eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, but but you know, we, we didn't have arthritis sure. and, and other itises. Other, other, you know, itis on the end means inflammation. And, uh, but now our diets are, you know, in a healthy diet might be 20 to one omega-6 to omega-3. All the, the uh, salad oils that we have in our foods, processed foods and baked goods, uh, safflower, sunflower, uh, uh, soy, uh, cottonwood, cottonwood um, canola even, so we end up having a lot of omega-6 and not have a lot of omega-3, and what do we have? Inflammation. So we, if we're, and if we're not eating enough uh, omega-3 rich foods that have particularly the EPA and DHA that you'd find in cold water fish, then we have uh, um, in inflammation, and, uh, and then we need a supplement to balance that. And for folks that are on plant-based diets, there are algae sure. sources now of the uh, EPA and DHA as well. We can get omega-3 from other sources, from, uh, flax. from hemp, from flax, from chia, um, um, but we don't get the EPA and DHA, that's an important component that we need for cognitive function and that we need also for uh, having healthy inflammatory balance. But the algae supplements do contain They do that. have that now, oh, awesome. yeah. They do. Very cool. Yeah, so there's options now for folks on plant-based diets. Nice. And every so often, uh, folks will, somebody, I, ha I was in a coaching session with somebody the other day and I said, what well, would you consider eating sardines? He says, oh my gosh, I, I used to eat those with my dad whenever we watched football games. I love sardines. <laughs> I haven't eaten them in years. Yeah. And, you know, just a reminder. Sure. This person already knew that. Yeah. And already was something that she was excited about eating. Yeah. And a lot of folks will run the other way when I mention that. But I had sardines yesterday. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Good man. Good man. You knew I was going to say that. <laughs> Um, makes my, my nutritional health coach uh, heart feel good that you had Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Lori Roten asks, love your channel. Thanks, Lori. 
Uh, I have a question about sugar cravings. Are there certain foods and or dietary practices that can help to curb intense sugar cravings? I'm wondering if there are specific foods uh, that help in the moment and also some dietary practices that can bring the cravings to an end over time. This would help so many people in our current culture of sugary processed foods. Indeed, that's, yeah, that's a great question. And that's one of, the, um, one of the reasons the popularity of the ketogenic diets have uh, burst on the scene over the last few years. And uh, we're, um, with the ketogenic diet, that's a um, uh, low-carb, low a low to moderate protein and, and high fat diet. And uh, um, when, we, when you think about different fuels that our body uses, think about, uh, I'll, I use this comparison uh, uh, for folks that have done a campfire or, or used a wood stove, um, have, you know, have you ever tried to keep that fire going with kindling? Mm. You have to keep throwing that in there on the fire. And um, that's, that's the, the sugar in our diet, the carbs in our diet. And that, um, that log you put on that keeps you warm all night, that's the fats. That's a much more sustainable burning uh, source of energy. But when we're wired to, um, to uh, use uh, carbohydrates and, and we're not adapted to using fats for our main source of energy, uh, we're constantly going to have those cravings. What, what, I, what we call uh, being on the blood sugar roller coaster, mm. where your blood sugar, um, go, you eat a meal, say you have a, a bowl of cereal and some orange juice and... Uh, and a cup of coffee for breakfast, which I, I think that's, I, that's what I grew up having. A lot of folks uh, watching this probably have had that maybe once or twice in sure. their life. And uh, so your blood sugar is high, and then, and then 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, time for a break, and you're going to be looking for a donut, because your blood sugar is going to go low again. It's going to crash. So then you'll be looking for that uh, donut or that uh, cinnamon roll, and, uh, and then your blood sugar will go high again. And then, then for lunch, you're going to be looking for the you know, probably supersized the Happy Meal. And, and then for afternoon snack, you'd be looking for the M&Ms in the drawer. And, <laughs> and you know, so we, we keep going up and down. Yeah. And eventually, our, as, we, as we get older, our cells get um, uh, resistant to the job that insulin does to get sugar to where we need it. So the carbohydrates that we have in our diet turn to sugar. Some of that will get stored in our muscles and in our liver as glycogen to be used between meals or when we're exercising. And... Um, some of it will get used um, in, our, in our cells when insulin is being able to do its job, and the rest will, will just store as fat. And we become, at some point, fat factories. And um, so um, one of the ways to uh, avoid having, um, being on the blood sugar roller coaster is to eat meals that are more balanced. So if, instead of the, the bowl of cereal and uh, orange juice and the, uh, or any kind of juice, the juices are just so high in. Food's great for sugar. us, but the juice is just sugar. Um, if we were to have, say, some, some eggs and some, some uh, green beans or some spinach, and uh, uh, still, you can still enjoy that cup of coffee or a cup of, <laughs> cup of, cup of tea, and uh, you, you notice you won't be on that, the, starting the, your day off on the blood sugar roller coaster, and that can ameliorate those, those cravings. And it just takes practice to, to do that, and uh, usually we look at a 21-day, a you know, oh. trying something like that for 21 days, and uh, there's, 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 other, there's some books that are built around that and other guides that guide us to, to try to break that, uh, that habit, to break the um, to being on the blood sugar roller coaster. And the, 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 the especially important because as we get older and we, we, insulin can't do its job, then we'll be having even more cravings because we'll have had plenty of carbohydrates, but they're not getting used by our body and not getting even stored. We'll store some as fat and the rest of it's circulating in our body doing all sorts of damage. When, uh, when sugar is um, circulating in our system, there's a, a, something that happens to our, our tissues. Most of the tissues that the sugar is coming in contact with are proteins, mm -hmm. and those proteins get damaged by the sugar. It's called glycation, and we end up producing what's called gly advanced glycation end products. The way that I look at it or compare it, it's a little bit extreme. If you've ever grilled meat, that, that grilled part of the meat is, is, a, is, is a glycation process. So you're damaging you know, the, the proteins in your body with all that extra sugar. So it's a, it's a really important goal to be um, trying to um, have more balance and get off the roller coaster. So it sounds like with time and initial just difficulty, mm -hmm. uh, you could eventually change your cravings just based purely on may, maybe eating more protein and fat. Yeah, you know, when I've had, to, I've had the opportunities to teach um, a series of ketogenic diet mm -hmm. um, classes 
uh, as in my role here. And uh, so I've tried what I, you know, to walk my talk and to do what I've been teaching. And what I've found for myself when I've eaten the, the low carb, low to moderate protein, high fat diet, I had no cravings for anything at all. I'm never I'm actually even hungry. Yeah. And um, you know, I eat, have a more, more balance. And uh, you know, to, to, for me, that's more sustainable, especially working in a, a store. Um, you know, I have a, there's a cookie aisle here. <laughs> there's a chocolate aisle, temptations candy everywhere. aisle. Yeah. A lot of temptations. And I, I have zero willpower. I, <laughs> I, when I eat the way that works for me, I feel better, and I really cherish that. And I, that helps me to avoid uh, some of the things that I could very easily um, you know, do that I you know, wouldn't feel as good and stay off of that roller coaster myself. It's such a good answer. It's such a balanced answer. And uh, for some reason, my brain went to, isn't there an herb that you could take where it actually like diminishes the taste of sweetness? I, was it, um, I can't remember the herb, but I know I tried yeah, it one time at yeah. Occupy. And it's, um, um, it'll, it'll come to me, I'm sorry. But your, your, your approach yeah. is much yeah. more realistic yeah. and balanced. I, you know, I can, I, can, yeah. I, can, I can offer those. You know, we have a sure. whole section in the store of, of those uh, and it's uh, Genema Silvestri. That's right. Yes. And when you Genema, when you have uh, right. when you can you can do an experiment. Take uh, some Genema Silvestri. Put it on your tongue, and sweet things don't taste good. <laughs> and that's a great way. I to, did that once, and it yeah. really works. It's and crazy. One of the things that 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 I would suggest to folks that were using that is, if to buy your capsules of Genema Silvestri, open up one capsule inside the bottle, let, and let it open it up and, and shake it up. So when you whenever you swallow the capsule, you get the internal. A part that you digest, plus you get that taste on your tongue, that will make uh, sweet things not taste so good. We have these herbs, a uh, berberine alkaloid from Oregon grape and, and and golden seal that will also support our body using insulin more efficiently. So that's uh, you know a good herb for um, for blood sugar balance as well. And and there's a you know a dozen others that help support that. But if we can make those dietary changes, we're going to get more nutrients anyway because when we're having all those carbs are not, it's not a nutrient dense diet. If we're having vegetables and, and healthy proteins, then we'll, we'll have, um, get more nutrients. We'll be healthier. And remember that health span I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. we'll, have, we'll be able to meet that goal. That's a great answer. Uh, you taking notes? <laughs> uh, Nick asks, I work in a natural supplement store and get customers all the time uh, with digestive disorders. What is the number one nutritional deficiency or something they should supplement with for things like IBD or IBS? Thank you. Yeah, good, uh, good, yeah, good question, Nick. And again, I've been in um, retail settings uh, for about 30 years, so I've had that, those questions a lot <laughs> myself. Um, you know, it's, um, and again, each person is going to be, is have different challenges, and we want to support the, um, the healing and you know some of the healing nutrients to, to support healing the digestive tract uh, are you know amino acids. So if we support digestion, then the body can get those amino acids. Um, there's uh, um, I, looking at uh, um, the balance, uh, the microbiome in the in, in the gut is, is is important as well. And uh, you know eating uh, probiotic foods. Um, all the K foods, you know, kraut and kombucha and kvass and kimchi and, you know, depending on the person and what, what they tolerate, um, kefir or kefir, uh, yogurt, you know, uh, those are all foods that can support um, gut health. And, um, and there, are, there are some, uh, um, you know, enzymes that can help as well. It, you know, it depends on, the, again, it's an individual thing. Each person's going to be a little bit different. So, uh, so Nick, when you're talking to these, uh, these uh, customers that come to see you, just try to ask some questions about what they're experiencing and, and uh, you know, try to, you know, to meet them where they are and uh, there really isn't one size fits all. And, you know, and again, uh, you know, um, peppermint, uh, and a peppermint infusion is one of my favorites for calming mm -hmm. intestinal um, upsets and, and challenges, and that's a good, good, good way to. And that's so easy to, to grow and harvest from our own backyards, and we always have some dried, dried peppermint around our house. How about chamomile for something? Chamomile similar? as well. Yeah. Chamomile as well. I, I like to uh, tell peppermint's us, a little yeah. more more soothing. Okay. The, 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 if you get, you know, especially if you get some of the oils, it'll be a little more soothing for your intestine. It, it, it seriously works so well. I took a drop of chamomile tincture one time, yeah. and my stomach ache went completely away. Yeah, on my uh, right, behind, my right on my bookcase behind my desk in my office here, I have a some chamomile tea ready nice. to use, and I, sometimes I'll just throw it in a in my water bottle. 
the, the tea bag to enjoy that. And, you know, it's it's been a, one of my favorite herbs as well. I never made the connection that they're all K. Uh, yeah, the K, all K foods. <laughs> foods. <laughs> I love that. And kvass is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, so easy to make as yeah, well. Super yeah. easy. Nimrod Diaries is asking a question about how to support her sobriety with nutrition. Um, basically how to use nutrition to help them keep them sober. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's a good one. Um, well, you know, we, when we look at, um, at how our body's impacted by uh, alcohol, we, 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 we look at uh, our, our busiest and largest internal organ that we want to support, our liver, which does so many different functions, you know, besides, um, uh, you know, uh, blood sugar balance and producing bile to eliminate toxins and, and, and it has to uh, uh, process the, um, in the different phases of detoxification, uh, um, anything that we, any metabolites from our body's regular functions to the various things we're exposed to that, that will cause more, more stress. So, uh, so supporting, and I, I, I don't particularly believe in the, the concept of doing a, like a detox. Mm -hmm. Um, how I look at it is, is 24 seven our, our liver is doing the, the, the different phases of detoxification and, and um, um, you know, that we, and we just need to be supporting, supporting that on, on, a, on a regular, regular basis, particularly if we've had a long term of um, maybe, maybe freshly uh, or newly, newly having in, in sobriety, but having used alcohol. So it, I think it would be more important. That would be a first thing to, to look at is to support uh, liver function. Uh, one of my favorites uh, um, I learned from one of my herbalist teachers uh, is I, I'll, I'll um, in the evening have a, just a spoonful of, of, of milk thistle powder and mm -hmm. chase it with some water. And um, just to get, it's a wonderful bitter and uh, bitter herb and uh, we'll give uh, liver support. When we're sleeping at night, um, we're not using a lot of energy so our liver has more energy for the, for, uh, our body has a lot of energy for a lot of different things. A lot of things happen at night more, including our liver you know, going through uh, the different phases of detoxification. And, uh, and if we don't support our liver and if our liver has been stressed because of, um, of uh, things that we've eaten or, 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 or Im imbibed, um, then um, the different phases are not going to be working in sync. If it's, uh, if we're, we're, once we detoxify as part of phase one, those uh, metabolites are more toxic than they were before. And if phase two is sluggish, then we, we can be impacted. A lot of folks that come to see me because they have sleep issues, oh, I fall asleep fine, but I wake up between two and five in the morning. It's so typically, um, I suggest maybe instead of a sleep aid, they, they support their, their liver function because the more of those processes are happening. Sometimes if things are more toxic during that intermediate time between phase one and phase two, that can in, impact our sleep. So um, milk, you know, eating artichokes regularly in your diet, it's as simple as just getting the artichoke hearts and uh, uh, milk thistle, dandelion. Uh, during the, I can't, you know, the spring, and pretty soon the dandelion greens are gonna be popping up in my yard and I'm very excited about that to be adding that to my, my greens mix. And uh, you know, just, just the really supporting liver is, is really important. And on, on top of that, and, and along with that, um, is looking at the blood sugar roller coaster along with that. Mm. Because some, often what happens is we still have those cravings mm. and they can get translated to craving sweets mm -hmm. instead of alcohol. And we'll, then we end up on the blood sugar roller coaster and, and that's pretty stressful, as I mentioned earlier. So doing that in conjunction, uh, eating a more balanced diet to get off of the blood sugar roller coaster and, and, and liver support. I remember in my early 20s, uh, I, would, I would do Lent every year. I'm not Catholic, but I remember when I would not consume any sort of alcohol, yeah. I would have these intense cravings for like ice cream and stuff. And yeah. I was like, why is that? Okay, yeah. that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, also, I did want to comment on the milk thistle seed powder. So you're literally taking like a teaspoon and then putting your mouth and then swallowing. Yeah, probably a tablespoon, of, okay. yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, because you know, I really like say like the Gaia milk thistle capsules. I always mm -hmm. hear how great they are, mm -hmm. uh, but those could be really expensive for certain people. Yeah. I feel as if you bought uh, milk thistle seed powder, that'd be a much more economical way to get milk Yeah, and it's, it's a way that everybody can afford to do it. And, and again, it's, it's um, the, um, the extracts are, mm -hmm. you know, are, are standardized. 
mm -hmm. and so they'll standardize. They'll 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 spike some of the constituents in there. And again, I, you know, I'm just kind of an old-fashioned herbalist. I like the, <laughs> you know, the um, the whole everything that's in there. Amen. You know, I, folks ask me a lot about well, you know, about fat. I mean, we could do probably a whole lot, talk about sure. a whole hour about fats, and you know. Um, you know, and you know, and f you know, fat is really important for us for a lot of different reasons. So we can absorb our fat-soluble vitamins, and and uh, um, you know, I was, I was a dairy farmer for many years, and I you know milked you know 300 cows three times a day for many years. So that's a lot of cows that came past me, and I never had a cow give fat-free milk. You know, <laughs> so it's you know the components are all important. They're right. there for a reason, and I I try to honor that. Yeah. You know, and the same thing with our our. Uh, our, our, our herbs and our, you know, our plants, you know, the nutrients are in there and, and uh, we don't know what the long-term effects are if we're isolating a certain component and not getting it in balance the way it is in nature. I mean, maybe some folks might not agree with me on that, but that's my traditional way of, of looking at it. I did want to bring that up. Uh, you know, there, nutrition could be a very divisive topic, but I think everything Indeed. you said today so far has been just really well balanced and just yeah I don't know I, I think have you been resonating with a lot of this yeah, yeah that's my goal yeah, yeah. no I, I don't think you've said anything particularly controversial yeah. um, uh, but yeah I totally feel you I, I did want to say there's a great creamery here and we can edit this out if you don't think it's appropriate mm. but there's a great creamery here in uh, Eugene called Nancy's yeah uh, and anytime I see their uh, fat-free yogurt I just I go on to the next one I get the whole mm -hmm. Whole fat one, so yes, I totally agree. You know, they're you know, and, and again, they, that's one of my favorite companies. Wonderful people, yeah, amazing people. I love a lot of lot of friends in, in that company, and and uh, you know, Natural Grocers, um, our standard for our dairy products that we we, we share uh, is only from pasture raised dairy. Mm -hmm. And when we were getting ready to to open the store in 2014, I, and here in Eugene, I was a, I was afraid, well, what happens if we don't have Nancy's products? That would be hard to have a store here, <laughs> and. Uh, Fortunately, it was it worked out okay, and we were able to have that relationship. And uh, um, that's great. But most of the dairy in, in, in this state is not, um, is, you know, factory farmed and not yeah. not pasture raised. You were asking me about living in Wisconsin. That's my yeah. least favorite part is I don't yeah. have access to Nancy's. So, so Britt Zerley asks, would love to learn more about nutrition and hormonal imbalances. Specifically, what are the best foods to consume while trying to maintain a plant-based diet? Speaking okay. of controversy. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and, and for hormonal balance, um, you know, I, I, I again focus on um, liver health. Um, one of the challenges um, when, when we were having uh, hormonal imbalances for whatever reason at different stages in our lives, um, often there's a, because of our toxic world and how hard our liver has to work, and because of our blood sugar imbalances that cause our, make our liver work harder, that often um, will have um, um, hormones that our body has, that have been used, that are in the process of being conjugated to be broken down and eliminated. And, but if the process is not working the way it should, then our body will get confused, like, well, how much do we need to make of this? I, you know, is that, what's in my liver, does that count? You know? And uh, so I would look at um, first, uh, at, rather than saying, okay, this this herb will support us during, you know, menopause, or this one will support if we have, um, you know, PMS or whatever, you know, let's look at um, supporting liver health first, and then maybe add on top of that um, uh, other other herbs or other nutrients to support hormonal balance. Mm -hmm. um, our bodies are pretty amazing in trying to do that to keep that in balance and. We just get in the way with that sometimes by not supporting our the function of these wonderful organs that we have that yeah. do this really cool stuff. So Martha Hawks asks, Yaakov, what are your recommendations for optimal mitochondrial function? Yeah, well, yeah, mitochondria, that's the little energy factories that we have in all of our cells, and except for our red blood cells. And um, one of the, uh, one of the, the, the uh, uh, the, the popular ways to, to support mitochondrial health is to um, have uh, less hours of the day that we're eating. Mm. Uh, that would be, we probably have all heard of inter intermittent fasting, where we have a shorter window that we're eating, and the longer window that we have that we're fasting, that allows our cells to do the different processes our cells need to do to stay healthy, mm. 
and, uh, and one of the things that we'll do will support the mitochondrial health. And uh, that's, that's one of the simplest ways to do that. It's not adding any kind of food or herb or anything. It's just uh, um, having a shorter window of eating. So for example, getting up in the morning and maybe your first meal might not be till 11 or 12 o'clock and your last meal would be at six mm -hmm. and you have that long window for your body to be doing your cells and your down to the cellular level to be doing all the all the repair and detoxification and all the different processes that we do on a cellular level. You could probably do a whole episode just on that too. I do. Uh, yeah, I have I've definitely experimented with fasting quite a bit, intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. and it does seem to be all the rage these days. Mm -hmm. um, oh shoot, I had a thought I was going to say. Oh yeah, uh, have you heard of our project called the Art of Frugal Nutrition? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. so basically, we're t we're trying to help teach people how to eat nutritious foods on a budget. I, yeah. I want to do a module strictly on fasting and intermittent fasting because yeah. really what's cheaper than not eating? <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> and, but you know, eating the right foods yeah. that are not necessarily expensive, but that yeah. will nourish you. And then you know, back again to having that lower carbohydrate diet so mm -hmm. we have less of the cravings. Yeah. And uh, if we're eating uh, you know, the healthy fats and, 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 and our vegetables, the lower carb vegetables and healthy proteins, yeah. um, we're getting the nutrients we need. And then tie that in with uh, not multitasking and yeah. supporting digestion, and we get all those nutrients, and and we can uh, eat on a better budget for sure. Sounds holistic. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I know there's probably some safety concerns, so for sure do your research on fasting and whatnot. Yeah, but, uh, of course. Uh, yeah. You know, I, you know, I, I should have you know said anything you know starting off here that you know I'm not nothing here I'm saying is you know. <laughs> Is any kind of um, you know not not I can't I'm not going to contradict what your doctors tell you yeah. or or uh, or you know you know if you're making any kind of dietary changes or you know check how they react especially if you take any kind of medications for sure uh, yeah we say we're not doctors and we don't play one on the internet so. right Laura Van Horn asks what's your favorite nutrition advice for starting down the path of uh, personal holistic health it's kind of an all encompassing Compassing question. Well, everything that we just talked yeah. about for the last <laughs> hour, I think, would be, you know, I think would probably answer that that question. Would uh, that's actually the last question on yeah. here too, besides mine. So, yeah. uh, very good. Yeah, that's true. Uh, like I said, a very holistic approach. Yeah, and yeah very. I, I appreciate it. I got inspired from it. That's for sure. Um, so here's the final question. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we're going to say herbalist, but. You, you probably identify that's as an herbalist, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's your favorite part of being an herbalist, and what's your big why that keeps you learning and growing? Um, well, the, the plants, you know, just uh, um, the nutrients and the, the gifts of the plants is just an amazing thing. I, I've had the opportunity with some um, amazing herbalists to uh, do an herb walk and to just be, uh, you know, something that I might walk by and, and, and you know, then learn that, oh, that's, uh, you know, I can get... Um, nutrients out of that. I've just seen it as a weed or something and you know um, it's just uh, there's just nutrients there we can learn from uh, from from the herbs. I, I like to, to, to you know like the doctrine of signatures uh, you know what aspects of the herbs help us to know how they can support us. Uh, one of my uh, one of my favorites is uh, St. John's wort mm. and the St. John's wort flowers we, we harvest on St. John's Day which is the summer solstice and that's the brightest time of the year that supports us maybe in the winter, some of, the, some of our, our dark times to help support healthy mood. Yeah. So the herbs can teach us that way if we just look at them and look at their structure and how, they're, how, how, how they are in nature. I love that. Yeah. Very good. I, I've actually been consuming quite a bit of St. John's Wort tincture lately. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think it's very helpful. Um, awesome. Well, thanks. Uh, I, I, I got to ask, where can people learn more about you and your work? Well, um, you know, at this point, um, uh, you can reach me uh, through uh, um, Natural Grocers in Eugene. Go to naturalgrocers.com uh, slash Eugene, I, I believe, um, where, I, where I am. And, um, you know, reach out. I'm happy to answer your questions. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, like, sure. this has been fun. Like, I, I don't know if you know this, but, yeah, me getting into herbalism was by way of nutrition. So yeah. it's, it's been fun to nerd out. And we've got to definitely do this again because there's a hundred and something yeah. unanswered questions. So Yeah, look forward to, yeah. to doing this again. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Of course. All and right, everyone. And thanks for what you're doing. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, we'll see you in the next episode of the Herbalist Hour. Bye. And that's going to do it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Herb Rally podcast. 
If you'd like to hear more from us here at Herb Rally, we now have a text message community, believe it or not. Basically, it's just updates from us. We send about one to seven texts per week, uh, notifying you about new events, videos, courses, podcasts. You get the idea. It's pretty much like our email newsletter, just in text form. So if you'd like to receive text messages from Herb Rally, just text JOIN, that's J-O-I-N, to the number 541-256-2895. Again, that's join to number 541-256-2895. And to stop receiving texts, that's easy too. Just text STOP to the same number. It'll opt you out immediately. Okay, thanks again for listening. Have a great rest of your day.